Uh, so I put like this yesterday to, to the slides because I like what Matt, Matthew Miller said about Silver Blue. That Silver Blue basically is a federal system for living in the container world. I think that it really makes the point because they are like, maybe we could replace it even with that uh, Toy, Toy Story picture with like containers everywhere. So that's like how, how we can like describe a Silver Blue. Some really basic stuff about uh, Silver Blue. So it's basically a next generation desktop operating system. It's like it uses some fundamental technologies like OS3 and uh, RPM OS3 that are that were basically developed by the CoreOS guys. We are sharing uh, another like technologies with them, and we are together. If we put these like technologies together, and it will actually actually make the no, so let me rephrase it again. Uh, so we are sharing like a lot of technologies with uh, CoreOS team, like OS3 and RPM OS3, and then even, even the toolbox. Uh, what's like typical for this kind of stuff is that there are, so OS3, as you probably know, is basically a Git-like system for file systems, and like to deploying images, the operating system images, and so on. So some parts of this file system are mounted as read-only. That's like, uh, it has some pros and some cons that we will actually talk about it later. And another great thing about that is it does uh, atomic updates. So it's like necessary to respond to the new deployment uh, when, when you're actually doing the update and so on. So the main benefits of Silver Blue are at least in our point of view, the robustness. Uh, robustness of the system is basically done by these things that are mentioned over there. It's like atomic updates, so you basically avoid the uh, live updates that you are probably used to from the regular federal when you update the system by running DNF. But the thing is that it's not a great idea to update on a live system because it could be like several, there could be like several problems. And if I remember from the past, there was, I think NOM was crashing at some point and it was suggested that people should like download, uh, update the, update the, uh, that particular update like running in Tmax if they didn't want to do like the crash the whole system. And also there was like Firefox was misbehaving because some library that it used was like uh, up updating why, why it was, uh, why the Firefox was uh, running, and then the Firefox was misbehaving. Another, another part of the robustness was the minimal base OS. Actually, that's the minimal operating, uh, that the base operating system that, that, that actually Silver Blue is, so it should be like minimal to actually decrease, uh, decrease the, the problems that could uh, arise from like uh, basically adding more and more packages into that, uh, and it could be like b uh, basically bullet proof from the uh, problems with uh, updates when there are some conflicts and so on. Uh, the minimal base OS we are looking forward actually to the work that, will work it, that is done by Adam Shamanik and others, the minimization effort, because it will allow us to decrease the probably decrease the size of the base OS even more. And also the, so the minimal base OS, it's really the base, uh, base operating system. It's like, currently it's still not decoupled completely from, the applications are not completely decoupled from it. Uh, but in the future, everything will basically be on, in a flat packs and in containers. So we should really have like the but the base operating system should be really minimal and just like uh, more robust. Another part of the robustness are, are read-only parts of the system that basically <coughs> slash user is mounted as read-only. So that means I don't know if you are, if you have the same experience as me, but when I first got to the, to the Linux, I many times like completely destroy my system, but uh, removing some random library and so on. But this, at this time, if there would be something like server brew, it could help me like 
few, it would save me like few, maybe not too few, uh, many more hours than fixing or installing systems and trying to find what's wrong. And the, another part of the robustness is the uh, ability to roll back. That means uh, that if you find that uh, something is uh, broken in your currently running image, then you can easily return to, to the previous one. Also, another benefit is security. That's basically a combination of the uh, previous parts that, that's uh, read-only parts of the system, and also the minimum base, base OS because we are like decreasing we are shrinking the basically the attack surface by removing quite a few uh, uh, applications from from the uh, from the main OS. Uh, also, it's there is a known deployment. We were talking about with some uh, IT shops that are deploying uh, some operating system across their company, and they said that they it, they would like to have something like Silver Brew because uh, when they are hand handling the hardware over to, to their employees, they give them in, in some state, but as, as time comes and people are adding, removing stuff, adding and removing stuff from the from distribution, then it gets into a weird state, so they, when they actually try to produce some scripts or anything like that, they expect that, uh, that the system is in a well-known state, but Usually it's not, and then they are just fi fixing the problems uh, on like on each employee's system alone. So that would be really helpful for them because uh, then they could like predict in what state uh, or how the how the system will look like. Yeah, and also this like. Uh, at least not also the base operating system is the most important part. In to a degree, it doesn't matter if a container breaks or an application doesn't run, but it's totally unacceptable to not have the main operating system working. So we really have to have the, the main operating, operating system working to actually, because if, if you are, uh, if, let me rephrase it. So I'm, I do have a second laptop with, uh, with NVIDIA, and as there was the kernel 5.2 release, the NVIDIA binary drivers are not compatible with, uh, with that kernel. And as I'm running server blue on that, uh, when I was trying to up, uh, upgrade, then basically the kernel modules for NVIDIA are, are uh, compiled during the update. And so actually the, the update uh, doesn't com com uh, doesn't basically is, is not completed b because there are some uh, compilation errors. But I'm I don't have that particular update like installed. So it's not like in, in the old days when I would uh, just restart and the AK mod and so on will try to compile the module while, while booting the device, and that I would be like there with the, with the broken system. So that this would be like. Uh, some overview of the server brew and could like server, server brew reprise the current federal workstation? Yeah. So yeah, currently we we don't really have any any approved plan that server brew would take place federal workstation, but it's def definitely something that we are considering and it may happen in the future, but only if if really it's a, it's a acceptable replacement for Fedora workstation and certain criteria we are going to talk about are met. So as, as you could hear, uh, I mean the, the cont in terms of uh, the software content, uh, uh, Silverblue is not very different from uh, the standard Fedora. But uh, the biggest difference is in, is, is in software delivery. So it's not like the traditional way you install packages and they basically install stuff into the system itself. Uh, the, system, the system is basically immutable and the, uh, the standard way how to install software into Silverblue is through containers. And it's either, uh, it could be Podman, uh, for clear applications, uh, for command line applications, and uh, it's flat pack for graphical applications. 
does the uh, does the Pythag wave it uh, helps us in in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the great things is that you basically can decouple uh, the applications from the the base operating system. They can have different uh, life cycles, so uh, the applications can you know update and upgrade themselves uh, no matter you know. Uh, no, they lying on the underlying operating system, so we can you can get sort of like uh, two speed it uh, world where the the system could be stable uh, with some lifetime. The applications get updated as uh, as they as they need it or uh, they are at least. <sighs> okay, uh, then. Uh, n not yet, yeah. Oh, Tomás is going to talk about toolbox. It's actually one thing we, we consider uh, for, uh, the, to have a nice U, uh, graphical UI for that, but we currently don't. It's a common line base right now. Uh, well, uh, uh, there, is, there is also uh, another way, and that's, that's package layering. Basically, RPM OS3 allows you to, to install uh, RPM packages from repositories directly into the base OS image. Uh, so it basically alters the, uh, the OS image that is uh, delivered by Fedora and uh, uh, allows you to in, um, have uh, changes uh, by RPM packages in the, in the base OS. Well, it has, some, it has some limitations. First, it goes against the idea of immutable system. So one one of the benefits of Silverblue is that we, as a Fedora, we can test and deliver the base OS to you, and 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 we know that it's gonna stay that way. But once you start uh, changing it by RPM OS A, it's not the case anymore. Uh, and another another thing also is that uh, it's it's a, it's a nice way. Uh, it should definitely be something like the last resort. When you really need some package that uh, or something that can't really be done through uh, the preferred ways, then then you should do it. Like for example, you need a driver for uh, a printer that is only available as as RPM and needs to be in the base OS. Then you install that one driver. But once you go into dozens of packages uh, layered over uh, the uh, the standard base OS. Then first, like you can run into unexpected issues because that's not a setup we, we tested and delivered. And second, uh, once you, for example, you want to rebase to another release of Fedora, then uh, it uh, it may not just go through the rebase because of I don't know, dependency issues, etc. So this this is this is still there. It's probably be a solution for things that we won't be able to solve differently. But one of the goals we have is to uh, minimize uh, uh, the cases or that uh, would be in which it would be the only way for users. So once we, once we are uh, good enough that you know, package layering is definitely just the uh, last resort for a few cases, then yeah, that would be the goal. Uh, so I mentioned flat packs. Uh, is is anyone here at least a bit familiar with with flat pack as a as an installation format? So it yeah yeah. So it's basic. It's a basically a, a format that uh, uh, works across distributions, uh, pretty minimal dependencies. So you can you can uh, create one ins uh, installation. Could be even a file that can then be installed on uh, different distributions, uh, no matter you know what uh, what components they have, etc. It's basically all contained in a basically a container or sandbox. So currently, there is like the main source of uh, flat packs was FlatHub, which is pretty much a, an upstream project. Uh, uh, Quite associated with uh, with GNOME, but also KD is involved, and another uh, like companies like Endless, for example. Uh, they uh, at on FlatHub, FlatPacks are basically built uh, from source, uh, 
uh, mostly. I, I mean, if it's a proprietary application, it, it just it just like packages some some binary or some flat packs work even with with packages. That is basically, if there is, for example, uh, an official the package, it it just uh, pretty much unpacks it and and installs it in in a sandbox. So it's not always a source to flat pack, but uh, mostly. And we also started working on a, a Fedora repository of flat packs. Uh, and the, the fundamental difference is that uh, they are built from, from RPMs and, and only, only from RPMs. So basically, what you get is something that is basically verified by, by the Fedora project. So you, you are not going to end up with, with some arbitrary stuff that was uh, added there by a, a maintainer, for example, in a, in a flat hub. So it's, it's, it's something that we can uh, ship by default in, in Silverblue because it meets also the, the, all the legal, legal requirements, security requirements, etc. And uh, that's one of uh, our next criteria, basically, that uh, if you want to uh, go uh, uh, out seriously with Silverblue, then we need to have a, a, an offering of uh, those applications by Fedora, not to rely completely on FlatHub. On the other hand, yeah, so this is, the, this is currently uh, the situation. So FlatHub has been here for much longer, I don't know, three years maybe, and it has already accumulated 600 applications, while Fedora I've been working for, on that for uh, last month. I think the, the, uh, the building itself was introduced at the last vlog, but it took a while until it was uh, usable. So uh, we currently have 50 applications, which is, which is not bad, and we are uh, progressing. Uh, as I mentioned, also the uh, Fed Fedora ones are free software, so they basically uh, uh, are, have the same license and illegal uh, uh, requirements as uh, RPM packages in Fedora since they are built from them. Yeah, at, at FlatHub you can uh, get software with uh, different licenses, so open source, proprietary, etc. Uh, yeah, Fedora, uh, the, the flat packs are, are maintained by Fedora community, while at FlatHub it's maintained by like either software vendors who are behind the applications themselves or community volunteers. If, for example, the, uh, the original author is not interested in maintaining flat, uh, flat pack, there are community volunteers who are doing it for users. Also, uh, a big difference is, is that flat hub uh, flat packs are using OS3, so the same technology we, we use for the, the base OS in uh, Silverblue. While Fedora is more aligned with uh, uh, modules and containers in, in uh, Fedora, so we use OCI. So if you install the application, it, it behaves the same way. It's just delivered and stored in the, in the registry or the repository as uh, OCI compatible archives instead of uh, having an, an OS3 repository. Yeah, we, can't, we currently have uh, still some problems with Fedora flat packs. So uh, for people who want to build them out, out of RPM packages, uh, there, is, uh, there is still a lot of manual work involved. So there is currently no automation. So for example, let's say your, your flat pack is built out of 10 RPM packages. And in the ideal world, and, and that's the, the, the ultimate goal, is that if there is any uh, change in one of those 10 packages, then uh, like uh, a rebuild of that flat pack gets uh, like triggered automatically and you don't even have to do anything about that. It doesn't work that way. Currently, you have to, you have to trigger the build yourself and also uh, right now, as a flat pack uh, maintainer, you don't even get a notification about the changes unless you set up your own filters in Fedora message or something like that. So it's currently it's 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 not that easy to to maintain the flat pack. So that's that's definitely an area to work on. Uh, currently, we also don't have any policy 
set for long-term uh, support and maintenance. It, uh, to have a flat peg, you basically have to ask for another uh, uh, repository where uh, you host the, uh, the YAML uh, configuration files. Uh, so you don't really have to be even uh, like a package maintainer of that application. So if there is, for example, uh, Firefox in federal repositories, you can package Firefox as a flat pack and you don't have to be maintainer of those RPM packages. And currently we don't really have uh, set any uh, policy or boundaries of responsibilities between package maintainers and flat pack maintainers. And the flat pack maintainers ultimately rely on uh, RPM uh, maintainers because sometimes you really need you rely on spec files uh, on that build. Sometimes, it's, I think it's also somewhere mentioned that sometimes the spec files have to be adapted or fixed. And the thing is that uh, 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 Flatpak basically is not doing any sort of uh, uh, overlaying because uh, you've, you've got that runtime. Uh, this the, the application is using as a as running environment. And then you've got the application and its files on the top of that. And w when Flatpak was created, there was, the, there was no reliable overlaying technology that would be, that would be uh, present across all distributions. So basically what uh, the founders decided was that basically uh, the runtime would be in slash user and the app content would be in slash app, which uh, helped back then, but it caused a big problem for us now because basically now we can't use the RPM packages as they are already built, but we have to rebuild them with this, with this path. And uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't guess into how many issues we, uh, or problems in spec files we run, like hard-coded paths, etc. And it's something, uh, unless it gets fixed in spec files, uh, we are stuck on that. So really the flat pack maintainers rely on the quality of RPM packages and it, their maintainers a lot. So there definitely needs to be some, uh, some policy and, and boundaries of responsibilities around that done. Also, uh, we have a, we have, we are planning to set some goal, you know, uh, how many flat packs we'd like to have available as uh, or, uh, Fedora, Pecky, Fedora uh, applications as flat packs. So currently there are over uh, 1,000 desktop applications or more precisely uh, RPM packages with desktop files in Fedora repositories and uh, to go out seriously with Silverblue, Silver Blue, we would like to have at least 30% of flat packs, so like around 300, and we are currently at 50, so it's like we, we have to multiply the current offering a lot. There are still, uh, what we currently don't support are, are Delta updates. That's, the, uh, that's caused by using the, basically the OCI format that doesn't, support it if we, if we s would have sticked with uh, uh, OS3 and we would, be, we would be fine because OS3 uh, supports Delta updates uh, uh, for a long time. And that's something we, we would have to definitely uh, solve because currently, like you've got Fedora uh, runtime, which is 300, 500 megabytes. 340. And basically, if, if there is a single component changed, then the users would have to re-download uh, 350 megabytes. And you can imagine how, how often components change just in the base image of, uh, of Fedora. So we would definitely have something like Delta updates for that. So you currently we also, uh, we haven't solved the localization in Flatpak, so you get them in English only, but that's definitely something we would have to solve also to meet the criteria. Uh, what's also quite annoying for people who want to uh, build the flat packs is that the, if you want to build it locally, uh, there, there is no caching, which is particularly annoying if you build a big application. Like, for example, Felipe is building Gnomeboxes that basically includes all the virtualization stack 
And uh, how long does it build? Like three hours. Three hours. I, I, imagine like you, it builds for, for example, three hours, and it fails because of some error. You fix that error, and you let it build again, and you, you wait another three hours to actually find out if, the, if it fixed the issue or, or not. So this is, this is something we have to work on as well. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's something we don't have mentioned on the slide. Uh, yeah, one of the goals, like pretty close ones, is uh, to have flat packs and runtime spray installed on, on Silverblue. So currently, the basic set of applications is part of the base image. We like to have all applications besides like really uh, system ones like system monitor, etc., uh, as flat packs. So Firefox is currently on the base image; it should be moved to uh, uh, flat pack. So uh, we are working on, or actually the Anaconda team is working on having them pre-installed downtime and the, ba uh, the base set of applications. And now Tomas is going to talk about toolbox. Yeah. So. Flat packs are meant to be for the uh, graphic applications, uh, and toolbox is actually um, maybe I'd say not, not something about toolbox. What, what is it about? It's like uh, it's used to moving the development from the base operations system, how it used to be, uh, away from the main operating system to actually into containers. Uh, that way, how it's done, that. Uh, we are actually uh, mount, uh, passing uh, basic case of shell script around the podman, and what we are doing in the shell script that we are uh, passing uh, various various variables in, into into the container and so on. So even the graphical applications works inside inside the toolbox. Actually, it's also it's a easy way to get the traditional uh, Fedora on the silver blue. So if you spawn the uh, toolbox container. And you have the uh, regular Fedora over there, so you have DNF and everything, and you can pl play there, play there, and without like any consequences on on your main operating system. So we really want to get people uh, use the toolbox and so on, adopt the workflow to actually have the se separate toolbox per projects. Uh, let me say like uh, Python development, C development, th th this kind of stuff. And also, we want to have like special toolboxes for uh, for software that's actually hard to configure, set up, and so on. So I was working with a team in, in inside Red Hat to actually have the TensorFlow container or TensorFlow toolbox uh, ready because like TensorFlow is not that easy to um, easy to configure. Uh, so as, as I already said, uh, Toolbox is a shell wrapper around the Pullman project. Uh, that's nice, but uh, during the last half a year, we really had some problems with uh, Pullman and its regressions. It was basically, it was not a week uh, when uh, something didn't, didn't broke. So we are thinking about uh, rewriting it in Go. Uh, why Go? Because Podman is written in Go, and we could like easily incorporate the unit tests into Podman that will actually test our, our use cases. Also, we are thinking, uh, is thinking about uh, some like or integration to the OS, as uh, Langdon asked about the app uh, some application that could like list available like toolboxes and terminals and so on. So we do, we want to have some application that will showcase showcase what's available and what actually uh, users can uh, consume. And also we are we will like try to modify the non terminal regime has already like done the preparations for that to actually like really distinguish uh, in non terminal on, in what toolbox you are and so on. So probably like some differentiate by colors and so on. So it's like uh, easily, so it won't happen that you will uh, by accident write some uh, command in, in a different toolbox or, or in, in the host when you mean it to run it in a completely different place. So an another 
part of this uh, is that we really want to uh, make it easy to actually work uh, with the with the uh, system uh, operations, like f f to make it easier for the regular user to uh, update and so on. Uh, the uh, the main operating system. So we want to like improve GNOME software. Uh, currently, it uh, only supports the uh, the update, which basically means RPM OS upgrade. Uh, we want to actually have the uh, system upgrade there as well. That means actually like reba rebasing to the another tree or another branch. Uh, also, we want to have like uh, support for rollbacks. So people, if they will find there's something wrong with the currently deployed image, they could like easily uh, roll back to the previous one that was uh, working flawlessly. And also the persistent rollbacks that maybe Yeshi will talk yeah. something about. I mean, g generally this, this is all uh, possible well, through RPM OST uh, in, in command line. But we like to improve the, the user experience by uh, supporting it in graphical interface in GNOME software. Yeah, the, the persistent uh, rollbacks, it's basically uh, if, you, if you rebase, for example, from Fedora 29 to Fedora 30, uh, you find out there is something not working for you. Uh, Silver Blue easily allows you to go back to Fedora 29. You just debut, you choose in GAP the, the second entry which is the, the, the old image. Uh, the thing is that you, if you boot to the, the old image, uh, RPM or OST is still pointed to uh, Fedora 30, uh, 30 or branch. So basically, uh, you, if you want to switch permanently to uh, Fedora 29 and wait, for example, a month or two until your issue is fixed, then you have to change uh, that uh, <coughs> Branch as well, and currently we can only do it through uh, command line uh, or command uh, uh, your RPM OST. Also, maybe the, the last uh, flat pack rollbacks that's something you can do it also for, uh, for applications. So, uh, yeah, not only the OS, if something basing the OS, uh, OS, you can go back, but we'd like to support that also or make it expose it to users uh, also for applications because Flatpak allows it for applications as well. So you, for example, uh, update uh, LibreOffice uh, 6.3 was released today. So you update to that, you find out that something, you know, there was some regression in Calc and some of your spreadsheets just doesn't work with that. You can, uh, if you implement this, you can then easily go to GNOME software and you click a button, return to a previous version, and it gives you the, the previous snapshot of the application. So that would be uh, really good as well. Okay, the another thing that we are thinking about, like changing a little bit, is that are we updating too often? And as you can see, that based on the feedback that we are getting, yes, they are like, uh, Nearly every day there's an update go, go in. People are like constantly like getting notified by GNOME software or anything that they, they, sh they should update and so on. So we want to actually like change the stuff there to actually slow down the update, cy update cycle to like just two or three weeks or even maybe a little bit longer, but that's like to be decided. Uh, it's, there needs to like we have to cooperate with Fedora QE about the, their opinion on that because what we want to do in that time is to, like we really want to like properly test the update as a as a unit. So it's not like like separate updates that can influence each other, but we we want to see like the bigger picture, uh, how it looks uh, when you actually test the up, the, the update uh, as a whole. It could be like done by uh, manually by the early adopters and so on, or auto automatically. But that's to be decided to by the Fedora QA. So people like should uh, like op easily opt in for for the uh, uh, regular cadence at, at the cost that they will actually like update daily if they want to. Also, 
uh, what about the sec uh, security uh, updates? So definitely the critical vulnerabilities uh, will be pushed like asynchronously because these are more, more important. And maybe we will see if whether the same should be done for the impo important like vulnerabilities, but that needs to be like cooperated with the uh, with the security team. Yeah. Should I? Yeah. If you want. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, basically, mm, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are uh, some cases where uh, it, it's not really, you can't really uh, solve them through containers because you need to work with the, the, with the base image. And th those are probably uh, the cases where we will have to use the RPM or uh, uh, layering. And uh, yeah, one of the, the cases is, is drivers. For example, it could be even a third party software that is not you know, available as uh, flat packs. So currently we use RPM uh, layering for uh, Google Chrome, uh, for example. With, with the drivers, it's also, uh, I mean, we, the, w one example of, of tricky problems we've run into is that, uh, you know, you probably know HPLib, right? That's the, the tool for uh, HP printers. And uh, so you can, you can set up uh, the HP printers through that. And what some of the printers require, uh, like a proprietary plugin that, have to be, uh, that has to be downloaded from the HP servers. And this plugin is installed into a path that is set only in Silverblue, in, in slash user something. So we were like, hey, HPLIP is open source. We can just patch it so that it downloads it into VAR or something. Uh, but the case is that when we, when we actually investigated that, we found out that uh, it doesn't download the, the plugin uh, directly. It downloads a binary from HP servers and that binary does the download. So you cannot really, you cannot really patch it. Uh, so it uh, looks like the, the, it's, a, it's a case until we, we of course contacted the HP uh, developers if they, could, if they could fix it for us, but it's definitely something we just can't really go around that. So that's, that's a case where we will probably use uh, RPM layering uh, there. Also, the debugging experience. Uh, yeah. Maybe talk about it. These are basically, uh, from my experience, so imagine a situation that uh, something, no, you, you don't even have to imagine, it's like day-to-day uh, -day life, it's some application or anything crashes. And it's, it's the part of the OS, so how you can get like the use for backtrace or anything like that. So with, uh, with server rule, it's really hard because you, what you could do is, is like to get the, uh, with RPM to get the, in, in, like the version of the install package and to go to the Koji and da download the debug info packages and so on. It's like, th that's a horrible experience. So what actually OS3 allows you to do is like to unlock the system and have like made a reg regular, regular uh, writable system from there. And I'm personally using uh, uh, some scripts that actually are, I'm downloading and installing the micro DNF. And with micro DNF, I'm installing regular DNF to actually have the debug, debug info plugin. And at that point, I'm re re it's easy to like get, obtain the debug info packages and then provide the backtracks to, uh, to to the developer or anything like that. But really, the process really can be in that way and has to be really like simplified and so on. The problem is that we could maybe reuse uh, ABRT for that, but it doesn't play well with, with Silver yet, and we really have to like talk with uh, the ABRT team to actually improve that situation. And the last point over there is like dual boot user experience. So what what you could easily try the silver blue on your, not easily. You can try silver blue on your uh, regular Fedora workstation by uh, actually 
in, uh, deploying the uh, OS3 image into your root partition, into the uh, OS3 directory, and then just upgrading grab and just booting from over this directory. The problem is that the, uh, I think if you are using grab, not, not UFI, uh, was it like that? Uh, you have to manually update the configuration after like any update of the kernel, I think. So there are really some big problems and we should really make this like to work flawlessly because if we, if we fix, fix this, we could get like a lot of like early adopters of Silverbrew and, and new users. That's actually our, the team under our batteries is supposed to work on that and hopefully we should get something very soon. Here are some yeah. documentation issue taker. Uh, we we are planning the, the Silver Blue project in in uh, Teams. dot Fedora project. dot org. So you can, if you wanna see what we are working on and the progress, etc., you can you can take a look there. Even if, for example, you wanna wanna help and contribute. Yeah, but actually, once as we are working currently on, on the roadmap, I suspect that the the Taiga instance over there will the entities over there will actually change, change a lot to actually align with, align with the with the roadmap. Yeah. Okay. So also, that brings us to questions. Questions. Anyone? Rishi, do you have a question? <laughs> so, how many people tried Silverbrew in this room? Oh, nice. Wow. Do you like it? Yes, definitely. Nice. And from those who didn't try it yet, do you think that uh, fixing the the like the Dula boot experience could like convince you to try it? No one. Okay. So it's. it's so what is stopping you from using Silver Blue at the moment, or giving it a try? Yeah. My, my big, I actually sent a list that are already to, to some of you guys, but um, my big problem is um, plugins in uh, Flatpak applications. Um, a lot of the time they don't work, right? You have to like, you know, figure out how to get the plugin installed somehow inside the container. So if you want to use something like VS Code, it's very, very difficult. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. that's, that's, that's not a plugin that is packaged in the repository, right. so right. it's, it's okay. It's Yeah, I mean, with, with VS Code, for example, one of the, 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 the issues we also have to fix is basically that uh, VS Code sh should only work with uh, uh, the components that are either in the, the flat pack on time or in the host, but we like to find a way, like for example, you can hook up your uh, development uh, Podman container, for example, with that uh, application in, in flat pack. So so software that's not there yet, right? Um, and, you know, I think Toolbox starts to get down this path, but I think encouraging a mechanism where you can get GUI tools that haven't been put to Flatpak yet. So the big one I ran into, and this was a while ago, but it was Meld. Um, you know, I wanted to get Meld, couldn't figure out a good way to get it without having to reboot, and I was like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna reboot every time I need this yeah. software. So um, I think, some combination of toolbox and like being able to launch GUIs from toolbox might solve a big chunk of that problem of the, you know, it's like, yeah, I'd love to adopt it, but I still can't completely break my workflow being an early adopter, right? You mean like, like pro propagate? To run a GUI application for toolbox. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but you have, you have to you have to exec, like, execute the command in in the terminals. I mean, I wonder if there would be any way to export the desktop files. Yeah, the desktop files. Yeah. So so we and it's something called the run command that we want. So it's about like flat pack runs. So you could do a few box runs there. Okay. Uh, but the thing is like uh, we deliberately didn't get into dealing with like creating desktop files and things like that because then you start encroaching into flat pack territory and you are like. And two blocks are ultimately just a shell script. Like, right. So I, mean, I think I think the, the point being, like, and that along with, like, I think there should also be a, an alias on DNF, for example, in Silver Blue, that kind of says, hey, this doesn't work here. This is what you should do instead, right? It's like I think in the earlier Docker phase, right? There's a bunch of stuff we could do that kind of says, hey, you're doing this wrong, but until we can do it right, you know, this is the workaround, right? These, the, this is how you approach solving this, so that you can get over that barrier to entry. Because the goal, right, is to get as many like developer folk type using it as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. we, can, we can just tell them that they're doing something screwy and then fix it over time. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I was wondering if there's a help for that now with the other folk stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. Actually, I think I, I actually think I got it. It was just that was my example. Like I said, it was quite a while ago. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Come on. So I play a stupid uh, game that's kind of an old, uh, like a graphical version of NetHack called Shattered Pixel Dungeon. Somebody wrote a flat pack for it. I was like, all right. Um, so I was playing around with it. It's like many versions old. Um, and so I went and updated the flat pack. Um, however, I can't, there's no automation there at all to actually distribute a version of the build. Um, even though it passed, like there's an automated test and all that stuff, but now I'm gonna still wait. It's already been at least a week for somebody to go uh, actually, act you know, and merge that that request in, you know. I and that's right that's flat that's flat hub or this uh, is flat hub. yeah okay. okay. I mean, I, I work in Red Hat, right? I think there's probably somebody I could hassle to go actually fix this, but that seems like a barrier to entry that doesn't need to be there. You know? yeah. What about different desktop environments? Oh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, I, I don't think we wanna support the use case that you install Silverblue with GNOME, and then you can, besides that, you install XFC, KD, etc. I guess this is something that I mean, the, the whole, I mean, the immutable system as a concept uh, doesn't really work when you want to do huge changes to the base OS. It's really for users who want to just use the base OS, it works for them, and they do everything on the top of it. Once you want to build your own kernel, install different uh, desktop environments, and have XFC on Monday and KD on Tuesday, etc., then, then traditional federal will serve you much better. But it doesn't mean that there can't be a silver blue without, uh, 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 like, with other uh, desktop environment. I think there is. K no, there's KD and SFC spin. The yeah. All high driven by community. Yeah, yeah. So basically, simply like KD plasma spin and XFC spin. No one, no one really holds the the community members from building them. Yeah. But yeah, it would be KD spin, uh, just. Uh, the scenario where you have, you know, you install various or multiple desktop environments side by side, by you can th theoretically do it through the over uh, uh, layering, but that's yeah, not good. Why? So you would have even smaller base OS without the desktop. Yeah, you need, yeah. You need direct access to... It, it really makes sense to, to run it in the same namespace as Tarly base OS. Yes. Yeah. I mean, 
you don't think of your phone's uh, screen as a, as a desktop environment, right? It's like Android. As if, I mean, if you don't have working debug, your system wouldn't boot, and if you don't have, if you don't have a login manager, and at what point do you draw yeah. the I mean, this is, like, we started looking at trying to do some models, uh, trying to how, how can we break out GNOME as a GNOME module, and it's still really hard. I think, I think the, I think the goal actually is correct in that um, we, we would like to separate out the desktop environment you know, and all its friends from other parts of the operating system, but I'm not sure that Flatpak is the answer to that. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me to run it in a, in a container. In a, uh, right. Then, then you run into lots of problems, right? You know, with the, the, the base desktop components are actually contained in a container and they actually have to interact with uh, other components in the base OS frequently. You, s you see into how many issues we run with uh, sandboxing desktop applications, like sandboxing desktop, base desktop components that would be like a hell of uh, fixing. Yeah. And I really liked what Christian said yesterday on his talk. We will actually do the, the research and so on, fix the, like, do the hard work and so on. And at that point, community could just take our work and replace the non packages with anything what they want. But I expect that they will need to adapt like KD stuff and so on. Probably, mm -hmm. no, no, but I expect there will be some changing that needs to be done to packages themselves. Okay. Any other Any question? Probably a last one since we are. So, if nothing, so thanks. Thank you for your attention. attention.